what attracted me to the technology field was I started tinkering with uh, like video production, right? And uh, more digital media oriented things. So you got to think like Macromedia Shockwave and Flash and Macromedia Director. And the more that I realized like that I think I enjoyed the technology behind the tools is like what got me closer and closer into studying more of you know, how do you build these products? How do you design them? What goes into that? But that, 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 that was my like entry into, into tech. My favorite part about working in, in technology is that you get to build things, right? Like, I think we all like being crafty folks and creating things. And so for some folks, it's, you know, actually building physical things. For me, I like building digital things and it's, uh, it's like really, to me, just rewarding and satisfying, right? Especially when you get to build things for and causes and things that matter. I think like that alignment really, um, you know, really pulls you in. Before joining government, I started a digital health company. And before that, I was at Microsoft. And before that, I was at Salesforce.com. And so like my career had been really around enterprise software and kind of going from doing general office productivity tools to leaping over to healthcare, because I thought you should be able to apply those kinds of skills to problems that really matter. And then taking the leap into government, because for me, that was the next natural way to keep working on healthcare. The thing that attracted me to government work was the scale that you could have, right? I was in a digital health company before we were a small startup we were trying to improve the healthcare system at a you know in a corner of it and when the opportunity to work at the department of health and human services came about i i saw a direct way where my talents and skills could be applied to our healthcare system as a whole in the us and so this idea that i could work at that scale was incredibly attractive Oh my gosh, so many times. Uh, you know, the the, the my, my original stint in government was supposed to be just six months long. And I think I stayed there about three and a half years. And for me, every six months was working on a new problem or a new space. And the output of it, I was incredibly proud of, right? The first project I worked on was Blue Button, which is helping uh, patients and the public get access to their own health records. And that work was incredibly rewarding and meaningful. The next project that I switched to over the next six months was working on data.gov and the open data executive order, right? Going across all of our federal agencies and seeing what our taxpayer dollars have paid for and to make them public, right? I mean, especially, you know, if this, um, you know, when we look at all the good things that like GPS has done, right? This is a government asset that once shared with the people People, really good things happen. And when you look at all the data being collected from like the Department of Health and Human Services all the way to um, the Department of Ed and others, you know, there are really good data sets in there that could go to really good use. And then the next six months after that was continuing that work and I was really enjoying it. And then one project that I worked on was being part of the healthcare.gov rescue team. And that was us working with, you know, the incredible civil servants within CN. MS, as well as the contractors that were working on the project. And there, I've never worked on a project where prioritization was so simple, right? All of us knew that our goal and our objective was to get more people covered. And so what that meant is every bug and issue that you fixed or every feature that you added, it meant more people were getting healthcare. And that direct connection was really powerful. And then my stint continued on after healthcare.gov to help inform the United States Digital Service, which was taking that playbook of sending incredibly talented folks from the outs, you know, outside of government to work with people inside in government on the problems that matter the most. And so every step of the way for me, I think there are just so many stories and moments of where I've been incredibly proud of. And it really is because of the, 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 the direct like connection between the work being done and the people being helped. The turning point moment for me and the work that I was doing in government actually happened right after healthcare.gov. And it was asking the question of, in that crisis, what could be applied in other places in government to make sure that would never happen again? And in that, we looked at what we did on healthcare.gov. We looked at the practices and created this playbook, right? This digital services playbook that if we're, you know, if we could follow, which hopefully prevent things like healthcare.gov from happening, but playbooks are just, 
you know, a book of plays. And what you actually needed was people that could actually implement those processes and practices. And so that was the creation of the United States Digital Service, right? This way that you could bring hundreds of really talented technologists into government to partner with great civil servants and tackle the problems that really mattered. You know, on, on healthcare.gov, there was this one moment or, or many moments actually where, you know, being really curious helped, right? It was always trying to figure out what was broken, what could be helpful, what needed to be fixed. And so you were really looking and trying to see, um, you know, you were looking at every source. I mean, you know, in that crisis, in that moment, trying to figure out actually what was working and what wasn't was really hard. I think, you know, one of the things we noticed when we first got there on day one was that there was no monitoring, right? So we added the technical tools to be able to do that, but that still took weeks to do. And then we started adding, adding instrumentation to help us figure out where people were flowing through the system and where they were getting dropped off. And, you know, folks that work in product that helps you identify what you need to fix. But at a certain point, you know, you actually need to also start talking to people and um, the White House used to get letters and it still always gets letters from the public. And there was a stack of letters that were all were talking about the website itself, healthcare.gov and folks having trouble with it. And there was one that I was reading that, you know, sounded like a bug report, right? This family in Virginia was having trouble getting through the system. And so for me, it was this moment of looking at that, but then asking, can I talk to this person? Right. And in doing that, I reached out to this family and talked to the parent over there. And she was explaining how she was using the system. And the really sad part was that, you know, the bugs that she was experiencing with healthcare.gov, she thought were her fault. Right. When in reality, it was actually the system that was built. And, you know, in this call, I'm just taking vigorous notes of the things that needed to be fixed, the bugs that needed to be addressed. And it's just that like reality check that you know, when government builds things, it really matters. And it really matters that it works really well. And when it doesn't work well, people don't think of it like, you know, an ordinary app, right? Or service from the private sector, you know, whether it's like a consumer app or an enterprise one. Like in that world, you understand bugs and things are broken. But when a government system says you're not eligible or this doesn't work, yeah, interpret it differently. And so, you know, the bar for how we build things has to be high. The way that we communicate to our users has to be real, right? I mean, that moment there was that reminder, but, you know, my colleagues across government, whether they work in the Department of Veterans Affairs or Education can share similar stories, right? When they talk to the people using these systems, you know, no matter how hard or buggy they are, people are always trying to find a way to make it through them. And when the system doesn't work, they take it personally. And that's really bad. And it's one of those things where, you know, anybody from our community, when we see these bugs and issues, we're like, oh my gosh, like I know what to do here. I know how to fix and solve these problems, right? You see all these symptoms and you're like, well, let me go help try to fix and find the root cause. I, I mean, I, that, that energy that you get from serving is real, right? If you ask most folks who come into government, they, they'll say they came in for like a year or six months or some number of time and they end up staying for usually a lot longer than they expected. And you ask them why, and it's because there's another stone to be turned over, right? Another problem to work on. And it is this like really addicting and rewarding feeling because when you fix these things, you know, ideally on the other side, really good things happen or justice happens, equity happens, right? Like it's really powerful. You know, after serving in government, you really redefine what success means to yourself. You know, depending on which city you come from, success means a lot of different things, right? Whether you're in a New York or a Los Angeles or a Silicon Valley, like success means different things. But when you come into government and you see the work that you do improve people's lives, I think it changes your definition of success and that, you know, drive to continually wanting to work and fix and make our government work better for people and to improve things is like, I think a really positive feeling and a positive behavior. For technologists that are thinking about serving in government, I would say it's not a question of if, but it's when. And I think for all of us, we owe it to ourselves and to our community to spend time in government sharing the skills that we've learned and used in the private sector and to work on using it in you know for the greater good and so 
I would actually really encourage folks to just plan when that tour of duty is possible. And not just one tour of duty, but possibly multiple over years, right? I think like the best thing that could happen is for our community to serve in these two to four year stints and then to go back out and continue to work and then come back in and then go back out. And then, you know, I always like to say that, you know, doctors and lawyers have figured this out, right? In their career paths, serve Serving in a federal, state, or local government is a really rewarding thing, you know, for lawyers especially as well, too. And so I think for us as technologists, it's this opportunity to serve, to share your talents and skills, and then to go back and to keep rebuilding them. Because I think there is also a truth to our industry that it's always changing. And so it's almost also this reminder that when you go in, you have to also come back out so you can build up your skills again to go back in. And if we continually have this flow of great people coming in and out of government, we can fix so many things and we can make government not only effective and efficient, you know, we can really transform its relationship with the public. It's important that we have technology in government because every policy and program going forward a component will be tech. A colleague of mine who passed away, Jake Brewer, would always say that, you know, while policy is the pie, you know, technology is the pan, right? It's not just a sliver. It really supports and can carry the whole thing. And we really saw that in action with healthcare.gov, right? Without healthcare.gov, the Affordable Care Act wouldn't be able to be fully implemented. What's really important is that going forward, when government is trying to figure out what it does next, the table of decision makers doesn't just include policymakers, but includes the subject matter experts as well, too. And so in the case that I'm familiar with, which is healthcare, it's like you have to have, you know, doctors at the table, the healthcare community at the table, but you also need technologists at the table, too. What's important is that there's a difference between the administration and government. There are agencies that the work that they're doing matters and they're disconnected from the political apparatus that's happening in DC or anywhere. And if you really are drawn into an agency's mission, right? Like think the CDC, think the Department of Veterans Affairs, you should serve. And by focusing your energies on an agency which mission matters, you're sort of protected from the political things that are happening and going on. And I think then it's always up to you, though, if you ever feel like at any moment the political part of government is asking you to do something you don't believe in, you can always say no and walk away. But what's really important to remember is that we need great people working in government at all times, no matter what administration's in office or not. A well-functioning government builds trust with people. And when people have that trust, they believe in our democracy. There's so much work to be done. And I think the fun part about this is that, you know, you have these skills and you have to find an agency that speaks to you, right? Whether it's a advanced research DARPA or a way to improve healthcare and disability services for our veterans, right? Like there's all these options and places and things that you can pick and choose from. I think one thing you're gonna find is that you're not alone. The best thing about this time is just the sheer number of folks that are considering serving. And the best thing about going into government is that community of technologists that are on the other side that are working on these problems that end up being your collaborators. And these aren't just folks within the agency that you choose to serve. It's that entire community. And what gets really exciting is the work conversations that you have with them, right? You know, you always hear this sort of saying, like, I don't want to talk about work, but there's something really addicting about the work conversations that are here because the truth is they matter on the other side. And just hearing the patterns and the plays and how people are approaching these problems is so exciting. And so, like, I go back to that point. It's like, not if you're going to serve, but really, when are you going to serve? And then where do you want to serve? And then going and, you know, raising your hand and saying that I'm in, I want to do this.